Jellyfish are more than pain-inducing sea bees or harmless sea squishies. They are some of the oldest animals on the planet, despite having one of the crappiest fossil records. They're made of goo, water, and gonads. Don't be so hard on them. Fossil jellyfish are few and far between, but sometimes they do pop up. A brand new study describes one of these rarities and finds them to be both really weird and kind of normal. So let's meet Burgesso Medusa. Jellyfish are freaky animals. They have no central nervous systems, no brains, and flop around with a bunch of ocean soup inside their bodies. They are also some of the oldest organisms to ever live, having evolved somewhere around 500 million years ago, with the controversial possibility of the group stretching back to 700 million years ago. The jellyfish belong to the big old group called the Nadarians, which also includes corals, sea anemones, hydrozoans, and the parasitic Myxozoans. This massive phylum of animals represents a huge diversity in anatomy and ecology, and they are an extremely important group in modern and ancient oceans and freshwater ecosystems. One of their most fascinating abilities is how they completely metamorphose from a sessile seafloor grabby hand called a polyp into a free-swimming bag of jelly with a bunch of little dangly things just sort of hanging out underneath it, a form called a medusa. This sort of thing occurs within the true jellyfish group, the medusazoa, which includes the cubozoans or box jellyfish, the starozoans or the stalked jellyfish, the hydrozoans or water animals, and the truly true jellyfish, the skiffozoans. The evolution of this freaky change in these backboneless animals seems to most likely have occurred once, with the groups that split off from that evolution variously keeping or losing this life cycle change. But of course, convergent evolution of this life cycle has also been thought up by some other eggheads. Since these ocean squishies were some of the first complex animals to evolve, they are the super special secret sauce to understanding the origins of animals with bodies divided into two equal and mirrored halves, animals that are bilateral in their symmetry. The big but here is that because these squiggly little beasties have no bones or shells and are made up of mostly water, they almost never fossilize. That pretty much means their evolution is mostly mysterious. Hundreds of millions of years have their perks here in that eventually at least one of these water bags is gonna find itself dead as a flatfish in a windstorm and float its lonesome self down to a place that will capture its essence for posterity. If that happens at least once, then over hundreds of millions of years you will eventually get a good enough sample size of these silly creatures to piece together a generalized evolutionary history. There are some measly rumblings of the greater Nadarians from rocks dating to the late Ediacaran to the early Cambrian times. So, you know, about 580-ish to 530-ish million years ago or so, give or take, for the sake of argument, hypothetically, probably, maybe, most likely, this time chunk preserves bits of evidence of these squishy critters diversifying into all the major groups with us today. A major diversification event of the entire Nidarian phylum. It was like mayflies in July. You know what I mean. There were microscopic little bitties, there were impressions made by the flabby soft bits, and there are hard mineralized tubes that look like witch fingers. Now, these ones are a little hard to place, but some nerds think that they are what they call stem group medusazoans. So, like early proto-medusozoans. Well, they think these hard things are that, or they might be unknown members of already known groups. Go figure. One of these weirdo groups are the Conyolariids, which are essentially tentacle-mouthed pyramidal shells ribbed for her due to a fluke of how the beast grew. These bizarre grabby grabbers have been compared to the stock jellyfish of today, or even the coronates, or crown jellyfish. Though, more recent research has found them to be more closely related to the olivoids and pseudoids as part of that stem group medusazoan identification I mentioned earlier. These ocean space invaders have a fossil record that stretches from the end of the Ediacaran to the end of the Triassic period, which is a massive time chunk. 
They lasted all that time, only to go extinct before the dinosaurs took over? Sad, really. Sadder still is that no evidence of a free-floating fluid bag stage is known for the conulariids. With recent evidence pointing to these little water gremlins losing that form, at least in some species. Microscopic olivoid fossils dating back to 535 million years ago may point to the evolutionary origin of swimming medusae. However, these forms are encased within a periderm, which is an armored outer shell or skin and likely could not sustain any form of dynamic locomotion. As I've gone over, finding body fossils from Nadarians is hard, mostly because they rarely fossilize. The body fossils of these guys that are most likely to decay to nothing are the free-floating medusoid forms. They're soft and made of gloop and float around all willy-nilly, so rarely get to sit still in a place with sediments to bury it for all time. On top of that, because these critters switch between sessile polyp forms and free-floating medusoid forms, you can't really get a good grasp on their ancient life cycles. Which ones are the babies, or adults of whom? Impossible to tell with five fossil medusoids without any association to their polyp forms. There are apparently some impressions made by medusoid-like forms in late Cambrian rocks, but since so few anatomical identifiers were left, no one was able to connect these impressions to known groups of sea jellies. Which leads to the most recent publication on ancient sea squishies published by Justin Moon, Jean-Bernard Caron, and Joseph Moisiuk in the journal The Royal Society Proceedings B in August of 2023, which describes over 181 specimens of what seems to be jellyfish body fossils that are intact enough to connect to modern groups of jellyfish. These fossils come from the Middle Cambrian or Woolian aged Raymond Quarry dig site in the Raymond Quarry Shale member of the Burgess Shale in British Columbia, Canada. With 181 plus specimens of these jellies, the team was more than able to identify enough anatomical traits to designate them their own animal, and so they named them Burgessomedusa phasmiformis. The genus name is a compound name with Burgess referring to the locality, the Burgess Shale, and the Latin Medusa referring to the clade Medusazoa, with the Greek phasma meaning ghost and Latin forma in reference to the ghostly figure of the umbrella. Like what you see in many other Burgess Shale sea squishies, all of the Burgess o Medusa specimens are preserved as flat carbonaceous compressions. They were squashed and decayed into their basic carbon. They are all buried at different angles, so they must have been buried quickly. Most of the carcasses are squashed on their side, against the rock layer they are buried on, though some are at oblique angles. None were found to be preserved vertically, though. Jellyfish don't seem to have a lot going on with them, when compared to other animals we might label as complex. So let's take a quick look to familiarize ourselves with the terminology. The whole bell-shaped dome part, that's called the umbrella or bell. You have the top section called the ex-umbrella and the underside part called the sub-umbrella. Tentacles are the things lining the bottom rim of the umbrella. Oral arms are the things that hang down from the center of the umbrella and are used for catching grub. Their mouths are at the center of the oral arm spread. Ropalia are little sensors around the bell margin. Gonads are little brain-shaped things on the underside of the bell. The insides are divided into the outer skin, the epidermis, the goo inside called the mesoglia, the second barrier called the gastrodermis, the stomach area called the gastric cavity, and the extensions of the gastric cavity called the radial canal, and then the circular canal. That's about all we need to know for now. Burgess o Medusa fossils typically show the umbrella, tentacles, and more rarely internal soft tissues such as the gonads. Disarticulation of external labile structures, like the tentacles, is observed with oblique and a small number of the laterally preserved specimens. In most cases, either tentacles are detached from the umbrellas, or specimens show no clear evidence of tentacles. In the latter case, it is possible that the tentacles are still concealed and folded below the umbrella margin, but groups of tentacles with their marginal tissues may also have detached as the bodies decayed or were ripped off and moved around from the environment. The umbrella surface texture varies from smooth to mottled, presumably as a result of differential decay processes. Similar mottled textures occur in other animals preserved from the same locality, such as Anomalocaris, suggesting a similar cause. 
The mottled textures tend to be expressed only on large specimens and above internal organs, including the gut and body cavity in Anomalocaris and the gonads or stomach area in Burgessomedusa. Clusters of three or more specimens show comparable states of soft tissue preservation, with some clusters consisting of similar sized specimens and others made up of individuals of different sizes. Overall, these guys aren't really particularly unusual in appearance. They're big old smooth jellyfish with a ring of soft tentacles along their rims. What makes them special is simply that they were able to preserve at all, but also the fact that they exist. They push back the known fossil record of the Medusa Zoan jellyfish back millions more years than anyone knew before. Burgesso Medusa looks a bit like some modern jellyfish, though the team still found it difficult to place them in a known modern group. Despite what many creationists want you to believe, the evidence shows that jellyfish, as well as all life that has ever existed, have always been evolving. So, despite a general similarity in overall form to modern jellies, these ancient jellies would have been in their own group and were still distinct from modern ones. For example, the team found that Burgesso medusa differs from members of the Starozoa group, the stalked jellyfish, due to lacking a stalk or peduncle, and their tentacles were not clustered. However, the general cuboidal shape of the Burgesso medusa bell and its tetraradial symmetry is a lot more like what is seen in the living Cubozoa family, the box jellyfish. Even here, it's hard because Burgesso medusa lacked four pedalia at the corners of the umbrella, an extension called a valerium, frenula, and developed ropalia. These are all features of modern jellyfish. The four pedalia is where the tentacles emerge. The valerium is in the inner space of the oral margin. The frenula are structures that connect the valerium to the inside of the bell, and the ropalia are used for vision and balance. The shape of Burgesso medusa's tentacles and where they are placed on its body are similar to the Scyphozoans and Hydrozoans. With all those comparisons and contrasts, the team tallied up all of the anatomical features of Burgesso medusa and placed them in the phylogenetic software. Burgesso medusa was found to be a stem cubozoan, stem acraspidin, or an early member of the group that contains both the cubozoa and Scyphozoa. Thus, despite some uncertainty, Burgesso medusa can be regarded with confidence as a crown group medusazoan and most likely as a stem group cubozoan or stem group acraspidin. Burgesso medusa also, therefore, unfortunately does not help to better understand what the ancestral jelly looked like, but does help to get a minimum age constraint for the evolution of large, free-swimming medusoid forms, which would of course be the Middle Cambrian. This means Medusae are very old. So with all that out of the way, what the hell was Burgesso Medusa even doing? Living Nidarians are either predators or parasites. Getting a narrower range of diet or ecology on these sea squishies means finding a good analog among living jellies. Ecology seems to be dependent on the anatomy of the bell. Some are torpedo shaped while others are saucer shaped. The smaller the jelly, the more variety there is. The best analog for Burgesso medusa seems to be the box jellyfish, due to size range and shape similarity. Living box jellyfish tend to forage in habitats with a lot of stuff going on, high prey density. Box jellyfish are nasty little buggers due to their valerium, which is a ring of tissue that extends around the bottom inside of the bell. When the medusa contracts during swimming, increased thrust is created because the valerium narrows the opening at the bottom of the bell. The valerium increases the efficiency of the jet propulsion. They also have big ol' eye spots, those ropalia, that allow them a good sense of their surroundings and balance. Juvenile box jellyfish, usually of less than 4 centimeters, mainly use jet propulsion like little squirting tops, while larger ones move by rowing their boats gently down the stream. Now, Burgesso medusa was probably not jetting around, instead it was likely a slow rower. This is because it seems to lack the ropalia of other jellyfish. Anything approaching a valerium was much larger than 4 centimeters and was cuboidal in shape. These critters were covered by sediments, killed and preserved very quickly. Normally this doesn't have a tremendous amount of information about the ecology of Burgess shale animals, but here it might. 
Since these guys were slow-moving large predators, and since there were so many found clustered together and in such good condition, and since fossil jellyfish are rarely found like this, it suggests these guys were spending a lot of time near the bottom of the ocean. One Burgessomedusa fossil even preserves the bodies of the arthropods Leoncoilia and Olenoides within its body cavity, which may suggest the jelly had snared and begun eating these animals prior to death. Of course, if it's not just coincidence. So it seems there is a moderate possibility that these guys were predators of bottom dwellers capable of capturing and subduing quite large mobile prey meaning they shared a similar place in the ecosystem as the giant predatory arthropods for which the Burgess Shale is so well known. Critters like Anomalocaris or even the arrow worms. Burgess Omedusa therefore adds to the complexity and diversity of Cambrian marine ecosystems and demonstrates that large predatory niches were not exclusively occupied by large arthropods during the early evolutionary burst of animals. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.